Okay, I am getting situated here. I hope you can hear me. I'm trying to work on these lights. I am excited. Okay, we're getting ready. Can you guys hear me? All right, so we have a chat box. You can uh, check in. I would love to hear who is joining me tonight, our very first class for Easy Colonize. Let's check in. Just let me know where you're from, where you're contacting me from. You don't have to say your name if you don't want to, but what city and state are you from? Let's talk. Let's do a little check-in real quick. All right, so yes, so thank you very much. I'm gonna give it a few minutes as we all tune in. I'm so excited to be here with you tonight. This is our very first course called e Decolonize. My name is Sitlali Sitlalmina Anawak. I am gonna be your professor for Friday nights from seven to 8 p.m. Join us here on YouTube. You don't have to register. You don't have to enroll, anything like that. Just tune in and we're gonna learn together. So yeah, so please, if you're joining me, please let me know where you're joining me from, city and state. You don't have to say your name if you don't feel comfortable, but I would really love to know where people are joining us from. This is really important. You know, This is a way for us to create schools, to keep, create educational communities here on our own. We're taking the power, we're establishing our own teaching, establishing our own spaces. So uh, I see a few comments here, Steven, Jaime, uh, Alicia, Alejandro, Chris, uh, Christian, Citlali. Hey everyone, awesome. All right, so what we're gonna do tonight, so basically, I'm gonna go, go over my little, um, a syllabus, right? I have a syllabus. I'm gonna share with you for next week's course. So for tonight's course, I'm gonna go over welcome. We're gonna talk about what is e-decolonized? What can you expect from these courses? What are we gonna learn? And some of the kind of what we're gonna be doing, how we're gonna be addressing questions and remarks. And first of all, I wanna start off with telling you that I'm really excited to be here with you and sharing this space live. I know I could have pre-recorded this and then shared it, but I think it's really important to connect right now with each other through these spaces, through, I know we're in quarantine and a lot of us are limited, but I wanted to offer my time. I wanted to offer my, my knowledge, my, my dedication to come out here and share space with you. So yeah, so if you're just checking in, tune in, Tell us your name, what, where you're joining us from, what city and state. I'm really excited to, to know where everyone's coming from. So, all right, so to begin, I, I always, always, always want to begin with land acknowledgement. Um, I am coming you live from Tongva Territory, that is in the Los Angeles and Orange County area. I honor and respect and acknowledge our native brothers and sisters here who have hosted us for all of these you know, centuries. I am honored and grateful for them hosting my, my people, our Tongva relatives. That is the land acknowledgement. That is where I am right now. And part of this is to take ownership of our time, of this space, and we're gonna decolonize YouTube, right? So every Friday night, tune in seven to eight. So first of all, who am I? Just a little bit about who I am. My name is Sitlali. I am a historian, poet, activist. I've obtained my bachelor's and master's from history from Cal State LA, 2016, 2019. And I'm currently uh, working to become a college professor. That has been my dream, but as well as continuing my activism. I have a poetry book that you can find on print. I self-published my thesis as well. You can find that. And my book is on Amazon. I'm trying to find other venues. It's been on there for a while, but I do want to look at other venues and not on Amazon. I That's what I do. I've been an activist for 23 years. I was looking at this today. I've been doing this for 23 years. Time flies when you decolonize. Um, and I wanted to show this. And what is e-decolonize? I wanted to, let me look at the time here, 7.02. I want to get into... Uh, what is e-decolonize? Why am I doing this? So like I said, first and foremost, e-decolonize 
is going to be a free live online course to offer my research, my passion for decolonization in a way that's structured, in a way that empowers and I hope inspires you. I have been an activist, like I said, before I was a scholar, I've been an activist. So my experience has been activism and academia and all the challenges within that. And I believe that the purpose of decolonization, the purpose of knowledge should be for us to facilitate knowledge. It shouldn't be for us to complicate knowledge. So what this does being on YouTube is a way for me to be able to share my research, my, my, you know, what I know, the people that I know in a way that's accessible to everybody. And let me just let you know, I have been getting a lot of messages from teachers, from families. So I ask that everyone please be mindful of that in your comments. I have a zero tolerance policy in this course for any sexist, homophobic, anti-black or other um, LGBTQ comments that is not will not be tolerated. You will be blocked immediately. I will not have a conversation about that. This I want this to be a safe space. I want everybody to, to take notes. I want everyone to feel comfortable. I want everyone to, to be able to, you know, to express themselves. Uh, and the way this is going to work, every week, every Friday, we're going to have a different topic to cover. You know, our, our history as Indigenous people is massive, right? It's massive. And I'm going to share everything I possibly can in a way that's easy to understand. I'm going to show PDFs. I'm going to share with you the books that I'm getting this from. I will also invite uh, guest lecturers. So I want you to learn about indigenous history, about decolonization, not just through my, <laughs> with me, but I want you to meet other people, right? Other people that are doing the work. I want this to be a pan-indigenous effort to decolonize. I want to invite our people from all of the Western hemisphere to share their history, their knowledge, whether it's through language, through food. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Tonight, I am doing it through webcam uh, for tonight, but in the courses to come, the next classes that we're gonna have, I would like to do a Zoom live so that I can show you images, so that I can show you PowerPoint, so that I can engage with you in that way. For tonight, it is an introduction and we're gonna get over, we're gonna go over what is decolonization? Why are we doing this? What is the purpose? And so, yeah, so those of you tuning in, check in, let us know your name. Uh, let us know your name and your city and state where you're coming from. Um, yes, so I've already went over the welcoming of who am I, what is e-decolonize. I am talking about zero tolerance and comments. Like I said, no sexist, homophobic, anti-black, or any other toxic comments will be blocked. I want people to feel sp safe in these spaces. I want you to feel comfortable. And that is how we're going to nurture that. So this is completely free. Like I said, as a professor, I myself am in the process of becoming a community college professor. I finished my internship at Los Angeles Community College last year. My dream has always been, one of my dreams has always been to be a community college professor. So I have the training, I have the passion, but I'm also taking ownership and being and teaching. I don't need institutions to allow me to teach. I don't need institutions to approve it. Um, what I'm doing is taking this time and owning up and sharing with you what I know. I am a teacher, I am a professor, and this is the way that I want to contribute to my community in these ways. Because I want to, one of the biggest challenges that happen with decolonization, I feel that a lot of people get caught up in uh, complicating it and, oh, policing each other. And what I want to do is introduce you to the, the, the tools, to the books, to the approaches that I've taken. Like I've said, I've been doing this for 23 years and I feel qualified and I feel passionate about this. And what, why not do it for free on YouTube, right? No registration, no enrollment, nothing, everyone. And because I know a lot of youth are tuning in, I want to let you know that I get messages from families, from teachers, from professors who let me know that they share my work, whether it's my YouTube videos or my written work with their classrooms. So I want us to be mindful 
for those of you who know, I know I use a lot of curse words, cuss words, but because I want to be mindful and I want to honor the, those parents that are sharing space with me, with their students, with their kids, um, I want to honor that. And if I can ask you, please, for all of us to be mindful that all of us here, this is for all ages, this is for all grade levels, this is for all educational backgrounds, we should all have the right to learn this history. It shouldn't just be stuck in academia. I don't believe that the knowledge of our history, that how we're decolonizing should be stuck in the elite circles of academia. I believe it belongs out here. I believe it belongs in democrat, you know, democratizing education. So that's what this is about. So that is the purpose. So what we're going to do, the way I like to structure this, it's going to be 45 minutes or so on presentation, on talking about all the stuff we're going to go into because we're going to unpack a lot. And then the last 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to address questions. I'm going to address concerns. If I do not get to your question, please don't feel bad. I get a lot of questions. I feel free to message me your question on my Instagram page. You can find me under Mexican Excellence on Instagram. So yes, so the first 30 to 45 minutes, I'm going to discuss and, and, and share what and teach what I know about particular concepts. And I'm also going to, at the end, dedicate the last 15 or 20 minutes on, a, you know, addressing your questions, hopefully having that type of discussion. And so that is my approach. My approach to this course, this course is called E-Decolonize, right? And like I said, each Friday, we're going to get into a different topic. The way that I approach education, the way that I'm approaching this, I'm taking an interdisciplinary approach. What that means is that as a historian, I'm gonna talk about history, obviously. I'm gonna talk about anthropology. I'm gonna talk about archeology. span I'm gonna cover linguistics, sociology, and ethnic studies. So we're gonna use all of those disciplines for us to discuss history, for us to discuss our people's um, knowledge in ways that it, it goes through everything, right? Every, decolonization hits everything. Um, what are some of the things that we're going to cover in this course? I want, I made a list. It's a long list. But my goal is that every Friday I concentrate and I bring to you the newest research, that I bring to you information that you may find of use on your journey to decolonization. Um, some of the topics that we're going to be learning in depth every Friday are history of indigenous people, a pan-indigenous approach, accomplishments of our people, indigenous identities before and after white supremacy, genocide and resilience, language, Nahuatl and other indigenous languages, indigenous women and resistance since 1492, who were the Mexica, Aztec, um, I am focusing on that because that is my particular specialty. So I wanna make sure that I share with you what I know about that. Uh, indigenous identities and the U.S. Census, I will dedicate an entire hour of our course to discussing the importance of the Census 2020. Another course will be on dismantling machismo from the crib to the protest lines, and we're going to talk about that, right? Uh, another course will be a civil rights movement, the Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex movement. Another one will be tracing and our disrupted indigenous roots. I am really excited because I will have a guest here that's going to share space with us that's going to show us the ways that he is uncovering and learning about his indigenous roots. And it's going to be probably a two hour course that night because the lesson and the tools that he has to share are massive. So that's going to be a huge one. Uh, other topics we're going to cover is decolonization, not a competition, how to avoid decolonial policing. And even though this is a course and I'm gonna treat this as, as with as much seriousness and dedication as an official class, I wanna talk about uh, decolonizing and talk about the mental aspect of it, the mental health aspect. This is not a competition. I want us to diffuse um, a lot of people going around saying, oh, that's decolonized, you're not decolonized. Well, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. I want us to love ourselves enough to be compassionate and considerate to all of our people and how we are, we are coming across this information. And I'm really passionate about that because it's important for us to be ethical with each other and to be compassionate. Another thing we're gonna talk about, and this is something to talk about, right? So of course, 
is decolonization and our family. How do we deal with this journey of decolonization with our loved ones, right? Um, another thing we're gonna talk about is decolonization and mental health approaches. So again, for the subjects that I am not an expert on, I will have lectures come on and be a guest so they can show their expertise with you. I'm not an expert on all these things, but I can definitely facilitate and you know share this space with people that are um, that are actually you know um, skilled and expert and experts in that field. So we're going to talk about that because that is also part of our decolonization. We're going to talk about decolonization and dating. Yes, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the many avenues. Um, a lot of times, people that are going through this decolonization journey. It's very toxic. Relationships could become very toxic. And there's a lot of issues that come about as you are decolonizing and you're dating and you're seeking, you know, uh, a partner. We're going to get into decolonization in academia. Those of us that have chosen academia and to battle the beast in academia, I'm going to talk about some tips and suggestions for our new generation that are going to college and what to expect and how to prepare for that. Decolonization and as far as work and the career, how to deal with your work environment as someone that is decolonizing, because yes, it hits everything, right? It's multifaceted, it goes all over. So yes, uh, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about decolonization and masculinity. Um, I will have a male identified person talk about that, what that looks like and all the complexities, because it's important to talk about that. And another topic is decolonization and language. So that is a list of some of the items that we're gonna be talking to uh, in this course. And so, yeah, if you're just tuning in, I'm asking everyone to please, if you don't mind sharing your name and your city and state that you're joining us from. So our students online, you know, again, this is not, you don't have to register, you have to enroll. I'm not gonna take attendance, right? I hope you make it every Friday, seven to eight p.m. Let's and let's own up this time. Let's. This is about love, right? This is about self love. This is about us, you know, finding ways to keep learning at this time. So yeah. So now that we covered all that, and like I said, uh, we've talked about the ground breaks as far as zero tolerance, right? We wanna make sure that we're very considerate for other people that are joining us. It's really, really, really important, uh, especially because we are sharing space with minors, we are sharing space with students, we are sharing space with parents and educators. So let's make sure. So, all right, so let's see who is tuning in tonight. We have San Diego in the house. We have, where we at, where we at? Oregon, Portland, Oregon in the house. We have, who else is here? Jen Rivera Bell, sisters in the house. Uh, Mesa, Arizona. We have Seattle, Washington in the house. Thank you for tuning in. We have Melissa from Central Michigan. We have Enrique from New York City. Beautiful, thank you, thank you as you're joining. Please go ahead and let us know where you're joining us from. We are creating our virtual class. This is what our virtual class looks like. I'm really excited to share this space with you. So for tonight, our topic is, I don't know if you guys got a chance to read that, but, uh, oh, sorry, one last thing we're gonna talk about. Every Friday, I will talk about the book of the week. So, you know, a lot of people right now are asking me what books do I recommend? And it's massive, there's so much, right? Um, but we are going to talk about book of the week, right? So that's going to be part of our course as well. And as far as follow-up discussions, like I said, the last 15 minutes of this class, I'm going to try to read as many questions as I can. Um, hopefully, we can work that out. If I don't get to your question or comment, please don't, don't feel bad. Uh, you can message me on my Instagram, and I will try to you know, answer questions the next course, which is next Friday. And yes, so again, this is our web time for tonight. Like I said, our future classes, I will have lectures and hopefully PDFs. I'll have presentations to share. Excuse me. All right, so, and let me know, um, this is the first time I'm doing this live and I'm using this little mic, so, <coughs> excuse me. Let me know if it sounds clear, if it's okay. I would like so like your feedback on it. I'm always looking for ways to improve. So with that, thank you for joining me. Now that we've covered all that, <coughs> excuse me, these courses will be posted on YouTube. They're gonna continue being there. So 
for people that can't make it, for people that are working right now, for people that can't make it, please share the link with them. It will be available forever and ever, you know, until people can join in. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So what we're going to get into tonight is decolonizing world history. And it's really important for us to talk about, um, you know, I know that this course is about easy colonize, right? We're, we're decolonizing education. We're decolonizing everyone. We're decolonizing everything. And so what I want to get to before talking about colonization, before talking about the crimes of of Europeans on our people, before we get into all that, it's important for us to start this course with a world vision, I guess, a world kind of approach to, to our history. And I wanna get into that. Like I said, our next course, I will get into with slides and all that, but for tonight, I wanted to have this discussion. Um, so please tune in. Okay, so, what we're gonna go into tonight, it's called Decolonizing World History, History of the Americas Before It Was Called America. And the book of the week I will share with you is American Indian Contributions to the World, 15,000 Years of Inventions and Innovations. So this is the book that, I, that represents this week's topic, which is Global History, World History, and Indigenous People. So I wanna offer this book. It's really, really important. I'm gonna get into it. It says American Indian Contributions to the World, 15,000 Years of Inventions and Innovations. Let me share that if you wanna do a screenshot. I will also, also anything I mention on these lives, I will provide the links in the description, okay? So what this book is, it's really important. It's a powerful book. It's not like a narrative. It doesn't read like a narrative. It's a basically an encyclopedia from A through Z, right? Talking about all the different contributions that our ancestors from the entire Western hemisphere gave the world, right? Um, and it says, this is a comprehensive resource describing the numerous inventions and innovations by indigenous people. And some of the, the lists that they have back here is irrigation systems, fertilizers, anesthetics, antibiotics, almanacs, sign language, writing systems, calendars, geometry, and scales, corn, potatoes, squash, and tobacco, wheels, yes, we had the wheel, wheels, shovels, and scalpels, and much, much more. So it's really, really important. So just to kind of give you an example what it looks like, it looks like this, right? It's a, a nice kind of encyclopedia form, it has a list of the different concepts, the different foods, the different items. And if you follow my Instagram page, I talk about, I kind of highlighted some of the, the concepts on here. And I love it because it's a pan-Indigenous approach. So it lists everything that they can. I'm sure there's a lot more ever since this was published. But it's a pan-Indigenous kind of survey of how our ancestors used their scientific knowledge, whether it was through mathematics, whether it was through uh, sciences, cultural uh, education systems. So this is the book, American Indian Contributions to the World. I really, especially if you're an educator, especially right now if you're teaching your kids from home, right? Um, I would say choose choose one of the concepts a week and go through it, right? Or maybe a day, choose a different concept a day and you will be amazed at how much information and how inventive our ancestors were. So I wanted to talk about that. That is the book of this week, American Indian Contributions to the World, especially, especially if you have children, if you are an educator, uh, if you don't have kids, get, the, get, your, get your nieces and nephews and let's sit down and talk about it and really unpack the ignorance, um, a lot of the contributions that our ancestors gave the world have been stolen, right? They have been hijacked. They, Our ancestors and our people have not been given credit for the contributions that we have made in medicine, in foods, in concepts. And it's one. It's really important. So there it is, American Indian Contributions to the World. So that is the book of the week. What we're going to get into next is, okay, so before, like I said, before we talk about colonization, 
before we get into that aspect, let's kind of pull away, right? And let's pretend that we're looking at the globe from this perspective. Now, first and foremost, we wanna get into how long have we as indigenous people been on this continent that has been known and constructed as America or the Americas, right? That's a very important question. And even though there's a lot of debates on this, I, when I started my schooling, I was an anthropology major. So I focused on the biological, cultural, um, biology of anthropology and archaeology. So I have my background also covers anthropology. And it's important um, to understand world history as it pertains to us as indigenous people, because you're going to see that given our history here on this continent, right? The last 500 years has nothing to do with our presence. So let's begin. So how long have we been on this continent? How long has it been 100,000 years? Has it been 50,000 years? Well, the most recent research has, sh has shown that we have been here 40 to 15,000 years, right? And they're going based on archaeological findings. They're going based on settlements. They're going based on artifacts that they have found, which is interesting because this says 15,000 years of inventions and innovations, right? So who's to know? Maybe the science of archaeology and anthropology is going to challenge this and make it even longer, right, that we have been on our continent producing and creating this for far longer than that. So interesting fact as far as the time and date. So yes, archaeologists and anthropologists have, it, have had this debate saying that our ancestors have been here 40 to 15, as, as long as 40,000 years and as recent as 15,000 years. And part of the, the human kind of connection, and I really want to talk about this because I think a lot of us don't understand how this works, right? Like I said, a lot of there's a lot of debate on this, but thanks to the scientific evidence of, of, of carbon dating, of DNA, of finding all this out, they've been actually able to trace it and say that the Bering Strait theory, for those of you who don't know, basically what happened is about 20,000 years ago, the there was an ice sheet that covered the two continents. And let me see if I can get an image of that. Um, and because of that, that um, ice sheet, our ancestors, right? This is again before nations. This is before any of that. They were able to walk over through the Bering Strait. And again, that, that ice sheet was there about 20,000 years ago. And it's important to get into that because a lot of people, they don't understand how that works. And we have to remember that as humans, our history on the planet it has been a long one. So the species that we belong to as humans, as Homo sapiens sapiens, this is, we're like the last of that, the, the arrival on our human history, you know, that there's a long history, right? And I really hope that you look at anthropology, biology, and look at how it is explained as far as human evolution, when we became bipeds, that means that we became uh, walking on two feet. Um, so there's a big history to that. But what I'm gonna cover tonight is before we get into colonization, let's get into the original um, interpretations of our history, right? Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of these things are debated, but like I said, I'm sharing what I've come across. I'm sharing my, my background as an anthropology major, as well as an archeology span major. And so the Bering Strait theory, and again, it is a theory, is that there was an ice sheet 20,000 years ago, through which our ancestors were able to migrate all the way down. And they're calling this uh, two major migrations were done. And the first migration, they're tracing this through DNA, they're tracing it through um, the mitochondria, they're tracing these migrations of our people 
to the first one they're saying went to north what is known today as north america and the second migration went all the way down to what we know as south america that is the migrations that they're tracking and all of this has been due to the um like i said dna the scientific evidence of the um carbon dating. And so not just are they looking at the DNA, but they're tracking the artifacts. They're able with carbon dating, they're able to tell exactly how old those those artifacts are, how old they've been there. Um, was there, was it humanly made or was it made by nature? So there's a lot that goes on to this, right? So first and foremost, that is what I wanted to get into. So before colonization, how long have we been here on the Western Hemisphere as indigenous people? And as indigenous people, this covers pan-indigenous, you know, what is called uh, Semanawa from the Nahuatl language or Tawantinsuyu, right? For our brothers and sisters of so-called South America. And it's important to get into that because as, as we talk about civilization, as we talk about um, how our people migrated, I want to tackle this idea of civilization. And it's important to understand that the narrative of civilization and brown people, the narrative of civilization and our ancestors as indigenous people, it's important to, to honor our ancestors because we as, as a people, as indigenous people, and I'm using the pan-indigenous term, as a people, we developed original civilizations without the help of outside factors. Let me repeat that for the people in the back. We developed original civilizations without the help of outside factors. So basically what this means is that our ancestors were, were smart enough intelligent enough, scientific enough to be able to develop an original civilization without the need of outside factors. And when I'm talking about outside, it's outside of the continent, right? I think it's really important. And I wanted to address this because I'm sure you hear this all the time. It's They make popular novellas about this. They make popular shows, you know, our ancestors, the, the, the racism that we experience as indigenous people, it's not just in you know racialized hierarchies, it's not just in the institutions, it's not just in all that, but it's also in the way that we are told our history and the way that we are robbed our credit when it came to civilization. So let me be more clear. We did not come from aliens. We did not come the from the Chinese. We did not come from the African civilizations. None of those rumors are true. And I'm saying that it's really important to establish that in this course because you have probably already heard this. The racism against our people as indigenous people, it doesn't just come from white supremacy and Eurocentricity. Globally, right? Globally, you know, a lot of other groups, right, view us as inferior. They don't view us as capable of developing civilizations. They're not, they don't see us as capable of developing mathematics, cities, states, languages. So it's really, really important to talk about that because if we're talking about it, the racism against our people and the way that we are viewed it goes even to the very beginning of our time on this planet, right? The very beginning of our civilizations. So let me say this. Is this here? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, let's make this clear. We developed original civilizations without the help of outside factors. It was not aliens. It was not the Chinese. It was not the Africans that brought us the ideas of civilizations. We were capable of this on our very own. Can you believe the fact that I have to actually confront this because it's idiotic that this is still happening. The normalized racism against us as indigenous people of the Americas trickles down to other groups of people. 
Not only is history told through the European lens, Eurocentric, it seems that many other people consider us recipients of knowledge, but never as contributors, right? So again, in this racist view of indigenous people and the way that we are belittled and minimized, we're never seen as the contributors of knowledge we're always seen as the passive recipients of knowledge. Let me give you an example, right? Um, Jared Dime, uh, no, J.M. Blout, I'm sorry, J.M. Blout from, um, he's a German, believe it or not. He studied the way that indigenous people were seen, right? And this is this whole idea of Eurocentricity. As indigenous people, we are perceived as the passive recipients to outside knowledge, right? When we are seen as passive recipients to outside knowledge, that carries in it the connotation of we weren't creative, we, were, we weren't active or assertive in seeking the own uh, tools for our own civilization. And this is important. It is extremely important to call this. So please, if you hear this going around, Please, 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 we need to challenge that. We need to put that to rest because no, it was not aliens. It was not Africans. It was not the Chinese. It was not anybody else that introduced civilization to us, right? Really important. I really want you to understand that. Don't believe the novelas. Don't believe the memes. Don't believe things look similar and this looks similar to this. And this looks similar. Let me tell you something. The similarities in the civilizations globally are, you know, we have to understand civilizations are created based on the cosmos, scientific observations of the world. And so this is important. Hear me out. Hear me out. Right. If you um, are observing the same sky, and this is global, right? You're on this planet and you're observing the sky, you start noticing certain patterns of the stars. You start noticing and tracking time, tracking stars. You start counting, right? That is a human uh, concept, the concept of mathematics and building, astronomy, observing the stars. The reason why there's so much commonalities among different human civilizations, it was not that one is the most, you know, supreme civilization that just, you know, spread out the knowledge to the rest and said, oh, here you go, civilization, civilization, civilization. No. What happens is as human populations, you are observing the same skies. You are, you know, noticing the same patterns of stars and you draw similar conclusions because in the human experience, there is no other galaxy that you can see. There, there are no other Milky Ways, right? Like we're tracking the same sun, we're tracking the same moon. And so that's how you have a lot of commonalities and these civilizations. And really important, and again, I wanna stress this, right? I wanna stress this. I have 10 more minutes before we get to questions and, and comments. So. We as indigenous people, and I'm talking about all of our indigenous people of the so-called Americas, right, from the Western Hemisphere, um, we were, we've we been here according to the Bering Strait, according to these theories, our people have been populating the so-called Western Hemisphere for the last 40,000 years, right? 40,000 years of settling on our continent. And that shows you that our people migrated all the way south. Some people went back up north. Some people, like, it's crazy. And if you study um, history from our northern brothers and sisters, right, from up here in North America, a lot of their origin stories will talk about coming from the, coming from the south, right? And this is interesting because it kind of tells you, you know, our ancestors, it's a massive landmass, right? The Western hemisphere is massive. And so what you have is a development of two original civilizations on the so-called Western hemisphere. The very first one, before people thought it was the Olmeca, 
that were um, the oldest civilization. But in 1994, uh, a Peruvian archeologist actually made a big finding and found out that it was actually Caral Supe in Peru. That is the oldest civilization that actually is older than the Omec. And let me share this with you. Like I said, this is the first class that I won't have my PowerPoints, but I will hopefully our next course, I'm gonna integrate PowerPoint slides and it's really, really important. Okay, so let's get into Super Caral, okay? Let me show you this book, really important. This book is called Before Columbus. The Americas of 1491, this is by Charles C. Mann, okay? This book, you know, and I said, not every book is perfect, okay? So let me tell you that right now, not every book is perfect, but he does dedicate, and he has more updated information on the Supe Caral, okay? So Supe Caral civilization is in Peru, and that is, it's dated, we have 6,000, BCE, right? And the way that they're looking at this is through scientific observations and the actual city, let me show you this. The city of Norte Chico, okay? Right here. This is Sucara for our people, our brothers and sisters of Peru, is dated 2600 BCE, okay? Before that, I think the Olmec, they thought it was 1800 BCE. And that's the Olmeca from Veracruz. So before they found this out about Supe Caral, before this, the Olmeca civilization, and you all know about the Olmeca, I hope. If not, we'll get into that as well. Uh, the Olmeca civilization was dated about 1800 BCE. And so that's what was accepted, right? And then this actual finding came and that actually let us know that no, our brothers and sisters far south actually developed the oldest civilization, right? Supe Caral, that's in the Peruvian uh, Norte Chico. And this is important, it is massive. It is massive to get into this because it's important to, first of all, debunk the idea that, oh, we weren't smart enough, that our people didn't have civilizations. And it's important to also talk about how you have the Western Hemisphere, right? The original civilizations were looking at the Supe Caral in the Peru area, Supe Caral. And then we have the Olmeca in Veracruz, or what is known as Veracruz. This is really, really important information. And so, and it's important, here we go. This is the Olmeca. This was thought to have been the last, the oldest civilization of the so-called Americas, right? The Olmeca. But thanks to scientific, you know, uh, process and carbon dating, obviously archaeologists keep digging. Um, and it was actually interesting that a Peruvian archaeologist actually found that. And that was beautiful because a lot of our people, a lot of our indigenous people are taking over these sciences, right? Taking over these disciplines that have to do with our civilization. So I wanted to get into that and begin this course. I have about five more minutes before we go to questions. Um, I wanted to begin our very first course giving you a kind of worldview perspective on our history because Eurocentricity and the racism that we face as indigenous people, like I said, it's not just environmental, institutional, it's not just you know land displacement and land theft, but it's the whole idea of being a civilized people, right? The whole idea of being civilized has been debated by Europeans against our people. And meanwhile, we're over here building original civilizations and developing massive contributions to the world, right? And yet, you know, people are wondering and thinking, oh, it wasn't them. It was the Africans. It was uh, aliens. It was Asians. It was, 
anybody else but indigenous people, right? And that is a racism that we have to combat. That is a race, the racism that narrates the history of indigenous people. And I wanted to get into that because it's important. If we're gonna get into decolonization and we're gonna get into understanding our pan-indigenous history as indigenous people, when you put that into perspective, the fact that we've been so-called been here since uh, 15,000 to 40,000 years, that is a long time. We've been on this homeland, on our homeland for a long time. And so for the whole idea that in 1492 and that in 1519, that all of a sudden that makes us a new race or that all of a sudden we're no longer indigenous because of the European invasion of our land, I think when you look at your history, your collective history as indigenous people, and you look at um, the 40 to 50 to 15,000 years that we've been on this continent, it makes it easier for us to combat that racism. It makes it easier for us to fight that genocide, right? Um, and so that's why I wanted to get into that today because it's really important. And that also highlights you know, we had to think about the, our ancestors were contributing, creating the most accurate calendar of the world, right? Even the Gregorian calendar we use today, they changed that calendar based on indigenous knowledge. So that in itself should tell you a lot, right? Um, there's so much more to talk about on this. And on a future course, I will get into the specific contributions that our ancestors gave the world. But as you can imagine, it's massive, okay? But it's important that we start off this way because especially for a lot of people that don't are not aware of archeology span and anthropology, it's important for us to get a panoramic view of how long um, we've been on this continent, right? Because that's always debated. It's always, we're always given these terms of being illegal and not belonging to this land when in essence, we've been here for thousands and thousands of years. So the racial idea that we're a new race and that all of a sudden uh, 1519 or 1492 disrupts us, you know, that should let you know, shit, I've been here for 40,000 years, 500 years isn't anything compared to, well, sorry, compared to how long we've been on this continent. So again, this is the book of the week, American Contributions to the World. And I also did share this one before Columbus. I guess we got two books, two books this Friday. Uh, this is um, Charles C. Mann before Columbus. And this one's more, I would say like for elementary kids, high school, it really, it's more friendly for those grade levels because it has so much images and it's beautiful to see a pan-indigenous approach to anthropology. Oh, and look at how beautiful this is right here. Genetic engineering. Yes, that you will definitely find genetic engineering throughout our civilizations, not just in Mexico. We have corn. We can do a whole presentation on corn. All right, so that's what we're looking at. Genetic, yeah, corn, for those who don't know, Corn wasn't, it didn't naturally grow out of the ground at that size. Our ancestors have been actually uh, genetically engineering corn for thousands and thousands of years. Corn has been dated 8,000 years. That's the earliest trace they found of Teosintli. Teosintli is the root seed of corn. Right? Okay. So, it is now 7.46, ooh, it's hot over here. It is now 7.46 and I wanna uh, get into discussion. I wanna address some of the comments and questions that have been left on our chat. I am very happy that you are joining me. It looks like we have 33 people here, uh, welcome. And yes, this is our weekly Friday night e-decolonized course. Like I said, we have a lot of topics to talk about. I'm gonna dedicate each Friday to different, different topics. 
I'm not an expert on a lot of things, a lot of muchas cosas, but I will bring, uh, I want to facilitate knowledge for you. I want to bring in uh, people that are experts in that knowledge, whether it's uh, people from Bolivia, people from Peru, uh, some of our indigenous people from Brazil, you know, because this is a global platform and we're on YouTube, I want to be able for us to connect as a pan indigenous community and to be able to honor space that way. So yes, here we are. It is 7.47 and I want to be true to my schedule. Like I said, we will do 45 minutes of me talking and sharing this beautiful knowledge, which I hope that you found useful. I will now get into the comments. And like I said, part of our, our approach here, because we want to be mindful of minors and teachers and educators that we... Um, that we make sure that we are we're considerate of our language that we use on these on these chat rooms, and we want to make sure that we are um, being you know considerate of that, right? Because I, I get a lot of messages from teachers, and you know I get families that are watching these videos, and I don't want to make it uncomfortable for them, right? And their kids as they're listening to me. So yes, I'm going to talk about some of the questions that you're leaving me here. Um, first and foremost, let me just tell you that I am so happy that you joined me. This is my very first time doing something like this. As you know, I have 12 years of producing for YouTube and trying to use all aspects of social media to share the message of decolonization. But I figured what better way now to be able to, to talk about this in a way that's organized and a way that's more intentional um, and that I can engage with everyone here because I believe that everyone should have access to this knowledge. So we don't have to go in a college setting and be in a college room for you to learn this. I want everyone, everyone to learn this. Okay, so let's get into, uh, for those of you joining me at the very beginning of the class, I asked everyone to please let us know where you're joining us from, the city and state you're in. It's always so exciting to see how many people join in, right, and where, where your respectable cities are from. Um, okay, here we go. We are getting into the last uh, 10 minutes of this course. We will talk about some of the questions we have on here. Um, all right, so let's start from the very beginning. Um, looking at corn, it says corn was not and is not naturally occurring to this day. I, absolutely, absolutely. That has to do with our ancestors' genetic engineering of corn and other foods as well. Um, I'm very curious to hear your opinion. Um, I will definitely have a course on talking about that. Uh, how far is to be true who claims? Um, who claims we weren't smart enough to have our own civilizations? That's everywhere. I don't know if you guys have seen, um, there's different groups of people that work really hard to discredit our ancestors, whether it be the, there's a certain sector of the black community that says that Olmecs were African and that the Olmecs, that we are African because the Olmecs were African because of their features. But that is not true. And that, and by us saying that that is not true, it doesn't mean that we're anti-Black. It just means that we're not going to allow our knowledge and our civilizations to be hijacked by other people, regardless of who it is, right? Um, and Dan Sertema, who is uh, the Africanist who coined the term and actually argued that the Olmecs were African, was actually, he was confronted and that's been debunked. And so I talk about that, especially in our very first course, because there have been, there's, I know there's documentaries about um, talking about the aliens brought us civilizations and they're trying to compare Mayan hieroglyphs and then compare them to astronauts saying, oh, look it, Pakal was going out of space. And it's just ridiculous the level of, of racism, the level of disregard that they have for our indigenous communities where they're actually like going above and beyond to discredit our people from our ingenuity, from our civilizations and our knowledge and our capacities. So yeah, it's a very popular thing to discredit indigenous populations and indigenous knowledge. So yes, okay, so I'm reading more comments. We have about nine more minutes. Um, okay, so how many classes am I planning to do and how does this, well, okay, so, like I said, I was inspired to do this. 
Um, I am aiming for 10 classes. That is a great question. Thank you, whoever asked that. Um, my goal is to be here with you every Friday from 7 to 8 p.m. And every Friday, I will try to tackle a different topic of decolonization. And let me share the list that I talked about earlier at the beginning of this course. Um, today, we talked about the uh, world history and decolonization because I wanted to give you a world view of indigenous people because Eurocentricity and white supremacy really attacks us at our origins, right? So even the fact that we have a civilization is being attacked. Um, so my aim is to offer 10 courses. So for the next 10 weeks, it is my goal to offer you new information, to bring in, to bring in lecturers who talk about different topics and to present knowledge as a pan-indigenous experience. Um, there's so much diversity to our civilizations, to us as a people of indigenous people of the Western hemisphere. And I wanna offer this space and share space with other people from you know in this global community, especially our people from South America, I want them to be able to come in um, and share their knowledge and explain to us a lot. Because me, I'm I'm very biased, right? Because I'm from Los Angeles, from Tongva territory. I am immersed in Mexica knowledge. I studied the Mexica civilization. I've studied somewhat a general understanding of indigenous history but I'm very limited, right? My my lens is Mexica, Aztec, that's what I learned, that's what I know. Um, but that is why I wanna be very purposeful and be able to uh, bring in more guests that are able to expand topics a lot more than I can. Um, so let's get into, okay, I'm reading some of the comments. We have a few more minutes. Um, Okay, how do we tell a family member that you can't, for example, baptize their children because I'm decolonizing? That is a great question. Um, and first of all, let's let's get into this, right? Um, how do you tell a family member you can't baptize? First and foremost, if I may share, um, a lot of Catholic traditions that we you know, are introduced as a, sorry, as a Spanish or Catholic tradition, a lot of those traditions actually stem from our indigenous traditions. So that's really important to understand. Um, for example, a quinceañera is not Catholic, right? A quinceañera has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. A quinceañera comes from very, it's, it's, a, it's a general idea of indigenous communities of the Western hemisphere, but I'll give you an example. A quinceañera comes from a Mayan tradition, from a Mexica tradition. A quinceañera had to do with rites of passage, right? Um, as indigenous people throughout the Western hemisphere, we've had different traditions. We had different ceremonies for different rites of passage, but through the system of white supremacy and genocide, they try to find ways to hijack the traditions that our people were already doing, the traditions that our people were already practicing. And because they were systematically destroying our way of life, our worldview, they were, you know, our ancestors also fought back and said, you know, fine, if you want to put a little Jesus on there, we'll put a little Jesus on there, but I'm still continuing my tradition, right? And that is very common. So to answer your question, I, I, absolutely, I absolutely understand that. What I look at, right, when when our families don't understand the journey that we're in and we are decolonizing, um, I try to tell them, you know, that tradition comes from our ancestors, right? That's when someone asks you to be their godparent or their godparent or mother or father, you know, it's a big honor, you know, regardless of the colonization, the, it's they're, they're basically telling you, I trust you with my child, right? I trust you with, with if anything ever happens to me, I trust you with my child. And it's important to understand that that tradition of baptism, of finding a godparent, right? It's actually a very, very indigenous tradition. So if you can find the middle ground between, you know, being their godparent maybe without the ceremony, maybe without the mass, um, 
but understand that that practice and that tradition actually belongs to us. And if we can find ways to educate our family members and to highlight the fact that it is an indigenous tradition, I think it's going to be easier for both of us, right? Easier for you on your journey of decolonization and easier for them that are, you know, probably not understanding. But to me, I always think of quinceañeras, right? Of, of bautizos. That is an indigenous tradition. Especially, I did read this about the, the indigenous traditions of, of the Peru area. Um, in one of my courses, the professor was talking about that, how that's what in our indigenous ancestors, what they did to create community, to create a bigger community, a bigger family unit. It was to baptize family members inside of the family unit. And so it was a political way to expand. It was also a cultural way for you to build unity and community. So I thought that was really exciting. Um, okay, so we have a few more minutes left here. First and foremost, again, I wanna thank you for joining me. You don't understand, I'm so excited, like I've been, you know, my dream has been to be a professor and that's on hold right now because of what's happening. I still work full time. I still have my side, things that I'm working on building my dreams, but to be able to share this hour with you live, regardless of wherever you are, right, on, on our beautiful uh, continent, it's a true honor for me to share this moment with you and to be able to discuss these topics that are really important. And most importantly, if I may share, I have about two more minutes. Um, most importantly, if I may share this with you, I think the most important aspect of decolonization is consideration to be compassionate and to be um, being mindful of each other, right? Because we're all at different levels. Decolonization looks different to everybody. Um, some people are not comfortable with certain things. Some people can let go of Christianity and Catholicism right away. Like, there is no set way for you to decolonize. There is no one way for you to to be free of, of colonization because as we know, we're being colonized for this very, this very moment, you know, right? Um, okay, so just a few more minutes. I'm gonna read a few more comments. And like I said, if I don't answer your question or comment, please don't feel bad. Um, I Please message me your question or comment. I'll try to address it or on our next course. And let me get into it here. Okay, theory, thoughts. Yes, so I am using this as a platform to uh, completely take over our education system. I'm using YouTube as a way to decolonize, to share the tools that I've been using to decolonize. Um, so speak on the last 12 tribes. Okay, speak on the last 12 tribes in the Holy Bible. Um no, I'm not going to speak on the last 12 tribes of the Holy Bible because I don't practice. That is not my religion. Um, and everyone has a right to believe whatever they believe respectfully. But I do not um, follow the Bible. The Bible was written in another part of the world that has no idea that we existed. Before the Bible was even written, we had already been building civilizations for like two to 3,000 years before that. So for anyone that's asking me to speak on this book and, and the apostle this, I don't need to because that's not my story. And I'm here to talk about um, our history as indigenous people and our, like, like we've talked about, right? Our history as indigenous people did not, be, did not begin with Jesus Christ. Our history as indigenous people was actually happening about two to 3,000 years before the Bible. So no, I don't need to talk about familiar eyes myself with the last tribes of Israel. Um, that's just another racist view of indigenous people, right? Atlantis, oh, I forgot about Atlantis to mention that. Um, so with this, I will make this statement and with this, I will end this course tonight. Um, no, we are not aliens, we are not Africans, Chinese, we are not the lost tribes of 
any group. We are indigenous people who have been on this continent for thousands of years. Through our ingenuity, through our intelligence, and through our scientific observations of our world, we were able to establish beautiful civilizations that date further about two to 3,000 years before uh, the European religions and other religions of the world. So I want you to feel empowered. I hope that this lesson, that this course, that this conversation uh, gives you things to think about. I hope I shared with you new knowledge. I hope that you tune in next Friday. Again, every Friday for 10 weeks, you know, for 10 weeks, I will be here sharing space with you. Um, I have an Instagram page. I have a Facebook page called Mexican Excellence. And I, what I use is try to use my platforms and my time to share knowledge and to decolonize because we need it as indigenous people. We've been under occupation for five centuries. And what I'm doing is using everything I possibly can to share this knowledge with my people, to decolonize and to remind us that we are beautiful ancient people, that we are not gonna be erased and that we're not going anywhere. So thank you so much for tuning in tonight. If I did not get to your question or comment, please make sure to message me on my Instagram. I will make this live available. I'm just gonna add a, a few more links of the books that we talked about. Again, the books this week, for this Friday, our American Indian Contributions to the World, 15,000 Years of Inventions and Innovations. And I also got into this book, Before Columbus, The Americas of 1491. So thank you very much for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you all here next Friday, 7 p.m. And for any of you that are wondering, what are we going to talk about next week? I think it's really, really important. What I want to get into is uh, white supremacy and genocide. I want to talk about that because I think that's in the same conversation of decolonization. So tune in next Friday. Uh, we are going to be talking about white supremacy and genocide, the indigenous experience. I'm really excited to share. I've already have a few PowerPoint uh, slides to share with you about that. There's so much to unpack. There's so much to say, so much to share. So until next time, thank you very much. This is Itlali, your professora on YouTube, decolonizing YouTube every Friday from 7 to 8 p.m. Let your friends know about this. Let your family know about this. It's a beautiful place for us to come together and discuss this and allow me to share what I know about our history, and if not, bringing in uh, guest lectures that will also be able to share a little bit more on our beautiful pan-Indigenous history. So until next time, this is Itlali with Mexican Excellence. Thank you so much. Students, you've been amazing. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for being here with me. And I am calling it a night. Kuali Yowali. Have a good night, everyone.